I'm going to give you a little bit of an overview about how I've got to where I am. So some of you know me, some of you don't know me at all. <clears throat> so I'll talk a little bit about how I got to the position of being an artist, making work about trees uh, and exhibiting where I am at the moment. I will talk a little bit about my motivation, why, why I'm interested in trees. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about what my influences are and give you a bit of an insight into how I make my work. Um, please feel free to um, put any questions or anything that you would like to in the chat. I will, um, I will do my best to check them all. As I say, it's just me. So, um, uh, so it would be good if you've got questions, put them in and I'll kind of go back and, uh, and double check with them. Uh, and so what I'll do is I'll get started. And um, first of all, this is my studio. So uh, I'll just kind of turn you around a little bit there. So that's my, my big drawing board here. That's my main workspace. There's a little area with sort of um, inspiration, sort of stuff on the wall, images that I've kind of, kind of carried with me for years. And then you can see behind me, I've got a kind of hanging system for works on paper. Um, there are lots of, uh, lots of works on paper. I've been out, um, outside doing a lot of drawing recently. So that's what you can see there. So there's no sort of real organization to it at the moment. And then here, which you can't see quite as well, but I've got uh, quite a large desk that's on uh, casters with my plant chest in it that I can store all my paper works and I can move that around. And that's my sort of main flat workspace. Uh, and then behind me here, I've got a storage area and, uh, and various other kind of techy things. And here I am at my desk. Um, so what I'll do, first of all, I will share some pictures with you because that's, that's why we're here, isn't it? So look at some pictures. OK. So hopefully you can see that. Welcome to my artist talk. I'm really glad to have you here. Uh, so. First question, how did I get here? And this is a photograph on a beautiful sunny day in the gallery in Lilithgow. So the exhibition that's um, running at the moment is at the Borough Halls in Lilithgow. Lilithgow is um, central Scotland, sort of between Edinburgh and Glasgow, if you know the geography there. And um, I thought it might be interesting just to share a little bit of how I've got here. Uh, an artist's path is often not very straightforward. Uh, anybody who does that themselves will know that. And um, mine has been a little bit convoluted, uh, to say the least. I, um, I grew up in Derbyshire, uh, in the centre of England. I um, always wanted to do art things. That was um, something that I've, I've just, it's just always been a part of my life. But uh, I went to art college and I eventually studied three-dimensional design. So I did a degree in wood, metal, ceramics, glass, um, fine, fine crafts is how I would term that. So that's my, that was my kind of training. I, I then worked in the theatre as a puppeteer, which was great fun, uh, but very tiring. And then I moved to Scotland. Uh, so that was about 27 years ago. So I've been in Scotland uh, for, for most of my kind of creative career. Um, I've worked in community arts for many, many years, about 15, 16 years in community arts and community development projects, all these different ways that we can kind of keep our creativity going and, uh, and, and use that for the benefit of, of other people as well. And about 10, 12 years ago, I started, um, I started my studio practice. So uh, I found a photograph from my first studio, which uh, was in the east of Edinburgh in a place called Edinburgh Palette, a big um, office block, big tall office block. I had a space on the top floor, fantastic views across the river um, uh, and really great light. It was a lovely space to work to start with. Um, when I first got my studio, I wasn't really quite sure what sort of work I wanted to do. This was kind of 2008. I was still doing lots of community arts work. Um, but I knew that I wanted to return to drawing. I'd always had this passion for drawing and really felt a strong urge to go back to drawing. But as often is the case when uh, people are sort of restarting a kind of creativity, you're not quite sure exactly what it is that you're going to do to start with. Um, so I 
uh, I tried lots of different things. And eventually, after about a year or so, realized that I needed to focus. Uh, and my focus became charcoal. I absolutely love working with charcoal. If any of you um, are artists, if you draw yourselves, then I'm sure you'll have tried charcoal. It's a very malleable, um, expressive medium. I absolutely love working with charcoal. And I began to make works about trees. Uh, I'll tell you in a little while um, why I decided to, to work with trees in particular. Um, but this example is a very, very early work. I made this one in 2009. And it's really a pivotal piece of artwork for me because it encompasses many of the themes which I've gone on to develop throughout my, um, throughout my fine art career. Um, as you'll see, it, it sort of looks like a tree, but it also sort of looks like a figure. Um, the story behind it is that, um, you'll see it's called Hopeton Half Tree. Hopeton is the name of an estate, which is just outside where I live. I used to pass this beautiful beech tree when I, um, when I was on my way to work, so driving along the road, looking at this gorgeous big tree. And then one day as I was driving past, uh, it had been cut, the top had been cut off it. And it was really shocking to see that. Um, it almost sort of looked like it was mutilated. I assume it was done that because it was unsafe. It was next to the road. So I'm sure there was a good reason for doing that. But what it made me realize is that the bits of the tree that I was interested in was the, um, was the, was the trunk. It was the sculptural form of the tree. I actually wasn't really interested in the little fine branches and the leaves and the, um, the sort of fluffiness of it, if I could use that word. It was the sort of solidity uh, and, the, and the effect of light on, on the trunk. So that one, although when I look at it now, I can see so many things wrong with it. Uh, that's just the, like the artist talking. Um, it's, it's still something that has quite a powerful effect. It just really takes me back to that moment where I realized, okay, this is the sort of work that I, I want to pursue. Um, and so I've been making uh, charcoal work about trees ever since. And I um, moved to my current studio, which is at the end of my garden. Um, I had it, that, that purpose built. Uh, so that's where I am now uh, in 2017. And this is a photograph that I took of it while I was preparing for the exhibition um, in Lanisco at the moment. So the, the, the big painting that you can see on the easel there is... Uh, that one is in balance, I think that one's called, um, and that's in the exhibition too. So this is my workspace. This is where I am. And uh, I've been making charcoals and I have been moving towards oil painting. As you can see here, that's, that's actually um, the oil painting. And you can see here is the drawing, which, um, which is on the wall in preparation for the oil painting. So I've begun for this exhibition to um, stretch myself, challenge myself, I suppose, in terms of materials towards oil paint. Uh, this is uh, probably the, one of the larger ones. It's about, uh, it's about a meter by one meter 20. Uh, I absolutely love working with charcoal, but one of the limitations is that it needs to be framed behind glass usually, which makes very large work difficult. And one of the things that I set out to do last year was to scale up the work that I did. I've done very large charcoal drawings before, but, um, but they don't transport very well either. So there's lots of reasons for doing it. But really, I wanted to, I wanted to test myself because I used to be scared of paint because it was too wet. And it was, it, was, uh, it was, I don't know, it just didn't feel like it was me. I, I, I did drawing and painting was something different. But um, I have really enjoyed the journey of discovering what oil paint can do and how I can say what I want to say in it. And as well as doing the studio work, really what, what underpins all of that is drawing uh, in the field as this is an actual field, but drawing in the field, in the woodland, in the hedgerow, outdoors, drawing trees while standing in front of the tree. Um, that's certainly something which is, is, you know, underpins all the work that I do. And this is an example from a place called House of the Bins, which is just outside Linlithgow, so it's not too far away from, uh, from where I am. The question that I'm 
often asked, why trees? Why do I, why do I draw and paint trees? Why have I got this very sort of single-minded um, focus on them? Um, it's a great question and it's not really easily answered because I think probably many artists would struggle to say exactly why or you know, kind of how far back their fascination with a particular thing goes. But I would say that trees were always something that I noticed. So I always felt like uh, it was that, you know, they had the kind of complexity and mystery and something to tell me. I always felt that. Um, I was always, I always enjoyed drawing natural forms. And um, I always enjoyed working with wood. So as I said, I did my degree in three-dimensional design. So I made things out of wood. I was used to doing that because my dad was a wood turner uh, and furniture maker. So, you know, I used to spend a lot of time in his workshop um, learning, learning what he was doing, using the lathe, um, you know, just learning what wood can do as a material to make things. Um, but I hadn't really thought about trees as a subject, particularly then. Um, but really what I find is that if I sort of look back, I can see that there's quite a long thread where I have an emotional connection to trees. Um, I, I feel like, I feel like trees are, trees are living things. They don't move very fast. They don't have life cycles like we do. They're very different. They live very different sorts of lives to the ones that we do. But, um, but I have a very strong sense of their aliveness. And that's really something that's always fascinated me and something that I want to get into the work. I also have, which I wonder kind of looking back if it's something which is a factor in my interest in trees. When I was quite young, we used to live near a place called Sherwood Forest, which is in Nottinghamshire in England, famed for being the home of Robin Hood, if Robin Hood um, really existed. Uh, it is a place with thousands of ancient oak trees and one in particular called the major oak which is probably one of one of the most famous trees in England uh, which is an enormous tree and has a huge big hollow in the middle and when I was a child uh, you used to be able to get very close to it and you used to be able to stand inside it so I have a memory of standing inside the major oak and uh, and just feeling feeling it enclosing me being able to look up and see the sea sort of little bits of the sky through the top. Um, so I think, I wonder if that's where the emotional connection comes from. And that connection is something that I build on as, as the foundations for my artwork. So I sketch outdoors, usually in the winter and in the spring, preferably when there aren't many leaves around. This particular photograph is quite leafy. Um, I'm, I'm not a big fan of drawing in the summer because there's too many too many insects and too much bracken and too many nettles and things in the way. I want to see the architecture of the tree. I want to see its structure. I want the, to see the kind of sun coming across it. Uh, and this little painting is one of the first of the oil paintings that I did. I called it Grounded because that's how I felt about being with these particular trees, that they made me feel grounded, something about their size and solidity. Um, at a time, you know, over the last couple of years where things have been very uncertain, um, the, uh, the feeling of being grounded was, was something that was very important. So you may be, be able to see some similarities there. Yeah, it's sort of in there. The painting's obviously something more. It's very small. It's about six by nine inches. That one is just a tiny one. So that's a little bit about why trees in general. Uh, why am I so specific about that as a subject? Uh, but then how do I choose those individual trees? You know, there are, there are millions of trees. There are uh, literally thousands that I could walk to. Well, what is it about those particular trees that I choose um, to draw and paint? What's special about them? Now, this is different. It's different for lots of different people. What I find... Um, interesting, appealing, fascinating in a tree is not necessarily what other people would. I particularly like the trees that are very old, that are falling apart, that are very um, complex, the ones that have a story to tell in the form. Um, so if they're, 
if they're pristine and very well behaved, they're a lot less interesting to me in visually and in terms of a subject. Um, so the trees that you see here, uh, two paintings that are in the exhibition, uh, are of the same tree of this tree, which is um, in Kinclavan wood in Perthshire. Um, this is a woodland which is run by the Woodland Trust and uh, it's mostly oak wood, quite young oaks, but it's an ancient woodland site. So they've, they've been felled at some point in the past and replanted. Um, but in amongst those oaks, there are some very, very old beech trees, which are a remnant of a former land use. They've all been planted deliberately and they've been planted on top of banks or, um, or stone walls or uh, stone dikes as, as they're known here in Scotland. Um, and these are really powerful trees to me. They, they really have a very, very strong presence. This was also a place where I, um, I used to travel when just after lockdown, when we're allowed to travel and there wasn't a lot of other things going on. This was almost like a place of refuge, I suppose, um, in terms of a place to go and feel good about the world because there was lots of things to not feel good about at the time. So these trees, I think, you know, I had a, a particular relationship to at a particular time. And you can see, you know, the, the, they have this characteristic of very sort of um, sculptural forms, very securely rooted. And you can see here that there's lots of branches and things lying around. This photograph was taken after Storm Arwen, which was um, a particularly destructive storm that we had last winter. And uh, thankfully, these beech trees survived, which is another thing which makes them special to me, is that they do have that quality of being survivors. They've seen out countless storms. They've seen uh, all the kind of change around them in the woodland, and yet they, they continue. So that's the sort of thing that makes a, a tree special for me. Um, this is a little video. Let's see if I can get that to work. So this is... Uh, a wee video of me drawing a tree um, up in Aberdeenshire a few weeks ago, just to give you an idea about how I work um, with it to capture that information initially. And um, you can see that this is a, an incredible twisted beech tree, the very, very unusual, very convoluted sort of form. Fantastic um, in terms of the subject because it's so complicated and so difficult to capture. I, honestly, I, it would take me weeks to do it. But I, I thought you might like to see a little example of how I how I work with them. So that hopefully gives you a little bit of an idea about what makes a special tree. Uh, so to um, to move towards talking about the exhibition, particularly a little bit of context. Um, the Lithgow Borough Halls is a um, 17th century um, public building. It's been around for a long time. It's a beautiful building, lovely light, fantastic architecture, and um, it's owned by the local council. West Lothian Council own it and run it as a venue um, for events and also um, it has a gallery space. So I was absolutely delighted to be offered an exhibition in the Borough Halls. Um, it, because of the sort of interruptions of COVID and things, there was a much shorter um, time scale for the exhibition than there might normally be. So I had about six, six or seven months to prepare for the exhibition. But as I said before, what I, um, what I wanted to do was to push myself in terms of the materials that I used and the approaches. So I, want, I knew I wanted to do some painting. I just wasn't entirely sure exactly what kind of painting it would be. So I went back to a, a piece of work, a charcoal drawing, which I did um, 2018, I think this one was, and um, it's from a beech tree quite similar to the ones that I showed you in Conclaven, but at a different woodland called Calderwood, which is also in West Lothian. Uh, and this was another one of those kind of pivotal drawings. You don't always know it while you're making it, but then there are some that you look back on and you think, oh yeah, that, that, that took a bit of a leap. That, that took me in a slightly different direction. And really what I what I enjoyed about this one was this quality of really sharp light and dark. 
and uh, and the feeling like many of the details were were lost, but that the the sharpness of the light and dark were in focus. Uh, so that was a starting point for the development of the work. Another um, another tree in Conclaven Wood, as I mentioned before. So I was visiting that woodland uh, quite a lot already, and really started noticing that those sculptural forms, that kind of strong light, and thinking, okay, this is maybe something that I can that I can use in my painting. So I spent probably about a month or so experimenting with different combinations of oil paints and mediums and surfaces because you know it's a, it's a huge a huge sort of toolbox of different things that you can do with oil paint it's incredibly versatile so i needed to find the way that suited me uh, to work um, and i made lots of little studies and you can probably see that you know they all have that kind of strong light and dark i um i actually did these as part of something called the 100 day project which is a, is a global project. Basically, you do a creative thing every day for 100 days. Um, and I had absolutely no, uh, no real expectation that I would complete 100 days, but I did manage to do 100 days. My 100 day project was about chiaroscuro, which is, uh, I'll, I can tell you a little bit more about later, but that's, that's this sort of sense of light and dark. Um, so some of these studies I really liked, got excited about, found a way that I could work with the oil paint to uh, take it away to reveal the light rather than adding the paint to uh, to kind of add in color and um, what grew out of that experimentation was this painting which actually became the title um, the title of the exhibition turning towards the light so you can see that uh, that light and dark is there so those those sort of themes a the theme of light and dark the theme of um, moving towards something light, something towards something towards something more hopeful, I suppose, was was going around in my mind as I was planning the exhibition. I have another uh, video there, which um, just to give you an idea about how I would make one of those oil paintings. So I am literally revealing the light. I'm applying the oil paint to a prepared surface, and then taking it away with a cloth, with my fingers, brush, um, anything like that, uh, anything that I can make a mark with really. And that's what then creates the painting. Then I can add and I can subtract and I can uh, put glazes and things on as well. Uh, and that's the finished painting. So that's very similar to the way that I work with charcoal, applying charcoal and then removing it to reveal the light of the paper. Uh, so I was, I was really happy that I'd found a way to do something similar but extra with the paint because we've obviously that now got that dimension of of color and uh speaking of special trees i've also been working at a place called dalkeith old oakwood um which is uh, a, a collection of it's not quite as, as large as sherwood forest but similar kind of trees similar sort of age so this tree might be about 600 years uh, old I'm told it's very sobering really when you think like that tree's been there for 600 years the day that I'm drawing it and it could be there for another 600 years yet uh, these are incredibly long-lived things but I put that photograph in because I wanted to show you how what what some of the sort of visual influences uh, come through in my drawings and uh, this is an example of my series called Rivers of Oak, which is what, um, what I've done for this exhibition in charcoal. Um, these are very gestural, um, very um, loose, quite abstract. And um, uh, I, I hope capture some of that movement. I call them ri Rivers of Oak because again, it's this idea of the tree turning and moving in response to its environment. Is it moving towards the light? Is it flowing? You know, the sap, does the sap create these sorts of um, the burrs and the, um, the eddies around them? So the Rivers of Oak series grew out of, uh, out of my knowledge of those trees. And then also in the exhibition, there uh, the drawings that I made with the tree. Uh, this is one of the examples similar to the one that I showed you um, earlier on 
from the House of the Bins. It's a lime tree. And I just love the way that the branches appear to be reaching. You know, there's a very, something very physical and, and lively um, sort of movement. So I suppose in the title, Turning Towards the Light, there's the, there's the light element as if, you know, you're turning your face towards the light to feel the sun, which the trees are, are doing. But also there's the, the, the feeling of turning and movement that I really wanted to get in all the work. <clears throat> okay, so um, influences. This is a good, um, this is a good question. What influences my art? Uh, anybody who has practiced as an artist or a writer or in any other kind of creative discipline will know that um, you gather influences from, uh, from all over the place and they stay with you. Uh, so I have collected many, many influences uh, and I didn't want to kind of uh, bombard you with lots of them, but um, there's the several things which I can see now looking back are kind of constant threads. Uh, this is a shot of my studio wall. It's not the bit that you can see behind me, but it's, um, it's a bit uh, up here next to my desk where I have a kind of mind map and I've mind mapped all the bodies of work that I've made. Some of them are just sort of little uh, seeds of an idea that I've not yet taken into, um, into production as it were. Um, but it's really my way of trying to gather all of those ideas and thoughts. And below this, you'll see some examples. You see there's uh, Rembrandt peeping out there. And below that, there are some, uh, some examples of artists and work who have inspired me. Um, there are two real kind of, two real themes, themes that are consistent through my work. Um, and two big words which may or may not be familiar to you. Uh, I'll do this one first, chiaroscuro. So I mentioned that I did the 100 day project, 100 days of chiaroscuro. Chiaroscuro is an art term. It's an Italian sort of composite word that means light dark. And uh, it's, uh, this is a little study that I made uh, of a Rembrandt painting. Um, as part of my 100 day project. And what I set out to do there was to learn about chiaroscuro in art history. Uh, so it's really, it's just a technique where there are strong contrasts of light and dark. And that is always something that I've been um, attracted to in terms of artwork, kind of high contrast things is, is, is definitely a theme. The other one, paradolia, which is um, it's a difficult word to spell. <laughs> But it's, uh, it's a really useful word. We will all know this. It's the phenomenon whereby you try to make sense of randomness, particularly visual ram randomness, but it also applies to sound as well. So we, we as humans have a kind of instinct to impose patterns on the world. And if we see randomness, then it makes us a little bit uncomfortable and we want to find a way to make sense of it. So looking at the clouds is the really obvious one, seeing animals or countries or, you know, other kind of seeing things, faces in the clouds. Um, if I go back to this one. So this is this is randomness. But the more you look at it, the more you can start to see things in it. And people do say that about my work. So they they would say that. You know, they can see faces or figures or animals or all sorts of things, sometimes scary, sometimes uh, eerie, sometimes comforting, lots of different kind of emotional responses. But um, pareidolia is something which I do encourage in that I am um, particularly for works like this, which are quite, they, you know, they begin in a very gestural way and are quite abstract. They can suggest so many different things. So that that element of ambiguity is something which I actively try to put in the work. Um, something else which may not be very evident um, in the beginning, because obviously it's nothing to do with trees, but um, prehistoric art is something which has always been fascinating to me. This particular example from the Chauvet cave in France was painted around 30,000 years ago. So 30,000 years ago, a human 
was able to make something as alive and uh, an energetic and um, impactful as this painting. Uh, what, what I love about these sorts of paintings is the economy of the line. If you see the, the, the animal, the, the mountain lions, I think, um, the, the lion on the top left, there's, there's very little really to describe that. And um, that economy of line, but that sort of strong spirit that comes through it, that's really something that I'm trying to hold in mind while I'm drawing trees in real life. So while I'm working outside drawing the tree, that's that sort of aliveness that I'm trying to capture. Uh, I'm also, although I work in two dimensions now, very influenced by sculpture. In a way, I feel as if my drawings are two-dimensional sculptures. That probably doesn't really make a lot of sense, but um, that's sort of how it feels when I'm making them. I'm kind of carving out the lines or um, excavating the, the charcoal or the paint to reveal the light. So um, a work like that, one of Michelangelo's uh, unfinished, was it unfinished? Did he mean it to be like that? We don't know, but... Um, that kind of sculpture I find really you know, visually very exciting and I have quite a lot of examples and pictures of that on my wall and also um, a sculptor like uh, Rodin who was very much influenced by Michelangelo's work again you can probably see there's that feeling of movement um, that sort of energy uh, poise that, that's in the in the sculpture so that's definitely something which is an influence too uh, thanks, Steph. I see that. Yes, two dim two dimensional sculptures. <laughs> yeah, so maybe it does make sense. I wasn't really sure whether that would um, whether that would make sense or not, but that's how it feels when I'm making them. Um, life drawing. Uh, I, I'm certainly not up to this standard, Michelangelo again, but um, life drawing is a really big influence as well. So life drawing is something which I um, I've always enjoyed doing. I um, I do it as often as I can now. One of the one of the great bonuses, actually, from uh, having to move everything online um, in 2020 was that lots of life drawing classes uh, moved online, and life models from anywhere in the world could could model for you. So I've had the the joy of drawing, uh, you know, an Argentinian dancer and um, a a burlesque dancer from Berlin and you know all sorts of amazing models so life drawing for me is is an influence in two ways there's the sort of practical element in that it's like it's like going to the gym for your drawing muscles so it's fantastic um fantastic practice learning experimentation you feel like you've really you've really worked hard when you've done some life drawing so I, I really enjoy that but then the other element is, again, this feeling of movement and figuration, which um, I think you've probably seen will come through, has come through in the, um, in, the, uh, in the earlier drawings. And also my choice of materials for something like this with the, with the red chalk is uh, Sanguine and Conte is the same materials <clears throat> that the Renaissance masters were using for their life drawings, mainly because that was a very was a very easily available material. It wasn't particularly because it was something special. It was fairly cheap. It was, I mean, these, these sorts of drawings were meant to be, um, just meant to be learning. Uh, certainly nothing, nothing like a finished item. So my life drawings, I, I don't show them or sell them, but they, they just sit in the studio and that's, that's, or just go in the bin. It's just something to, um, to kind of feed in to my, my visual memory, if you like. In terms of contemporary artists, Jenny Savile is certainly one uh, who I massively admire for, for the way that she approaches the figure um, and also uses charcoal as well. She's got a really, a really exciting style. She's very well known for her huge um, impactful paintings, but I, I love her drawing style as well. Uh, how do I make my work? Okay. Um, so just because I can't see all your faces, if you if you want to ask a question, then pop it in the in the chat, and I will see that and try and answer them. Uh, so this is a uh, a shot of the cabinet that's in the exhibition at the moment, in turning towards the light. 
and uh, it's really nice having a cabinet. You sort of feel like you feel like, oh, I've kind of arrived now. I've got a cabinet that's got got my things in. And um, what you can see here, some of my drawing materials, some photographs, a sketchbook. Um, that's a plate with my charcoal powder. There's a map here. So every little yellow dot that you can see is a, a, a group of trees, an individual tree, a woodland that I've visited and, uh, and drawn in. Obviously, the map's quite a lot bigger, but because uh, I go all over the place to do that. Um, but that's really the sort of that's the starting point, I suppose. My um, my kind of making uh, routine, if you like, is seasonal. So in the winter and the spring, I'm most likely to be drawing outside in the woodland uh, along with the trees. In the summer and the autumn, I'm most likely to be working in the studio. It sounds a bit counterintuitive. Why would I not be drawing outside when it's when it's nice? But as I said, there's lots of things that get in the way, <clears throat> um, lots of leafy things and flying things that get in the way of me doing that. So I prefer to do it that way around. And uh, the autumn is particularly good time for, um, for tree hunting, for searching out new new places, new locations. Um, I could I could spend a lot more of my time than I do looking for trees because it's really exciting when you find them. But there does come a point where you have to just say, OK, Tansy, that's enough. It's time to get down to drawing now. So uh, over the years, I've been tree hunting for, I don't know, 18 years or something like that. I've gathered lots and lots of favourite places. But, you know, there are particular particular woodlands like Kinclavan, like Dalkeith, like Calderwood that... Um, that I have been back to for many, many years. I've got photographs and sketches from, uh, from a great number of years. And it's really interesting to see how, they, um, how the places change. Um, so the, the, the drawing uh, with the tree is really where it starts. I'll start with the sketchbook, um, as we've got here, with much, much looser, just sort of note-taking, really. I suppose my sketchbooks are not beautiful things um, in their own right, they are um, they're working working documents, and then I'll do sketches along with the tree. Um, uh, there's something really special about just being in that environment, really, and and you know observing the sights and the sounds and the smells and the little insects like we've got here that land on my paper and crawl on my bag and uh, and all of that comes together to be a um, give me a, a really intense memory of the place and that memory of the place and the memory of that dialogue through drawing with the tree is uh, is something which then feeds into the studio work there's um quite a, an extended period in terms of this sort of this sort of cycle if you like um an extended period of uh working in the sketchbook working on compositions, experimenting with different ideas, seeing how things go together. So again, that's, that's, um, that sketchbook is a working document. Um, and uh, so there's quite a lot of preparation that comes along uh, with that. Uh, so Paul, I see your question. Thank you about the charcoal. I will I'll come to that in a minute. Uh, and uh, this is uh, a charcoal drawing this is a preparatory drawing for one of my large paintings in the exhibition. You'll see that I'm doing the classic art school thing of drawing with a, a bit of charcoal tape to the end of a stick. If you've never tried this, please try it. It's like having, it's like having a two meter long arm. It's really freeing. You get great marks. It's very good for working at a large scale. <clears throat> um, and so, Yep, so that's that's me working at the, the large kind of easel drawing board that I've got behind me. And I also work flat for particularly for the, the more gestural charcoal works. Um, so you can see a little bit of them there. So Paul, you're saying what type of charcoal do I prefer? <clears throat> I do I do have quite a mix of charcoal and I've trialed pretty much everyone you can get hold of. I, I'm not a fan of compressed charcoal because it has a kind of waxy, clay sort of quality to it, which um, it doesn't erase very well. So I use, I use um, willow charcoal, vine charcoal, and uh, I use charcoal powder quite a lot. Uh, 
so uh, let's see. So these are some of my Rivers of Oak series, some of which are in the exhibition. And these are about halfway through. So you can see there that I'm, um, uh, they're, they're still quite gestural. And most of that work is done with the charcoal powder. And then I will work into it with erasers and, uh, and then add uh, material to it with the, with the willow charcoal and things. So probably, you know, charcoal, it's a, it's a very versatile medium. There's so many different things you can do with it. You can work with it wet. Um, you can mix it with oil and make oil paint. So one of my, uh, one of my paintings, the one that's in the studio shot um, at the beginning of the presentation, that's done with um, charcoal oil paint. So it's very versatile material. And I think, you know, just experimenting with it, if, you, if you're interested in using charcoal, experiment as much as you can until you find something. And it's a combination of the, you know, the paper, the surface, whatever it is that you're doing. And these are the, uh, the same series, but pretty much finished. I think they're, they're all sort of up there on my hanging system for me just to, just to decide whether they are actually finished. Um, and I've got a little video which will show you a little bit of the process <clears throat> of that kind of gestural drawing. So you can see I've got feathers, I've got um, chamois leather, uh, which is a, a good kind of erasure tool as well as putty rubbers and things like that. Um, I'm, I'm finger painting here. I mean, it, it's just, it's fantastic. It's so much fun. I use brushes sometimes to move it around. Um, I use all different bits of my hands. There's a very large piece of charcoal there. Um, you know, you can get different sizes, but you'll find, you know, I, I have particular favorites and I get really sad when I've used it up because sometimes one particular piece of charcoal just does the perfect mark and, uh, but it, it doesn't last, nothing lasts forever. So that's to give you an idea about how I make the charcoal works. And that's just an example of one of them. And the, all the rivers of oak, the larger works, I gave them all sort of watery names because that was something that seemed to fit with the, um, the way that they seem to be flowing. Can wood flow? I feel like it can. That's certainly how it seems to me. Um, so where can, you, um, where can you see more? If you are in Scotland and um, fairly close to the central belt, then the exhibition at Linlithgow Borough Halls is on until the 26th of June. Um, I am there sometimes, so I'm going to be there on the 8th of May, so, sorry, the 28th of May, Saturday the 28th of May in the afternoon and Sunday the 12th of June over lunchtime. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll post these times on my social media a little bit nearer the time, so um, don't feel like you have to remember that or anything. It's just to say that I enjoy being with the work and talking to visitors, so um, it's a pleasure to do that. So if you're, if you're nearby, you can physically visit. It's a lovely place to be. Um, <clears throat> If you are not, I'm going to uh, just stop sharing that for now. And I, I'll share my website. Okay. Okay. So <clears throat> hopefully you can see that. Um, so if you are not able to see the exhibition in person, I uh, would, would like a more in-depth look then on my website, if you go into exhibitions, there's a page which is um, dedicated to the exhibition. Uh, there's the usual sort of text, me looking very serious there because I'm drawing a little bit about the borough halls and how to get there. And uh, there's a virtual tour. Uh, so if you, uh, if you want to kind of feel like you're in the gallery, uh, then you can visit the virtual tour and uh, see the exhibition that way. <clears throat> All right, I'll stop that sharing uh, and come back to this. There we are. So that's, um, so that's another way you can see the exhibition itself. You can see that on the virtual tour. You can see it with the full kind of catalogue listing on my website. Uh, I, I've also got a profile on Artwork Archive, which is my inventory system. Um, I was recently featured artist on, uh, on their social media and things, which was great. Um, some of you may have found me that way. If you have, um, it's really nice to connect with you that way. 
Um, I'm on the usual social media, um, Instagram and Twitter, I'm most active on, but I'm also on Facebook too. And uh, if you want to reliably hear about exhibitions and new work and some of the trees that I go out and discover, then please sign up to my studio newsletter via my website. <clears throat> There's a, just a footer at the bottom. Uh, I, send an, I send an email out maybe once a month or something, um, unless I've got an event, I can't, something like that. Uh, so I don't, I don't send a huge amount, but it's really nice to keep connected with people that way. Um, and emails are really good, a good way to, to get that connection going. <clears throat>